Now, Sir Keir Starmer is expected to promise that the UK is returning to responsible global leadership when he addresses the UN General Assembly in New York later today. Did it used to be irresponsible global leadership? I, th I, th I suppose that's the implication. Well, it comes against a bleak backdrop of ever-heightening tensions in the Middle East and the ongoing war in Ukraine. However, the Labour leader's use of Lord Arley's £18 million Covent Garden penthouse to film a Covid-era message calling on people to work from home threatens to overshadow his appearance on the world stage, at least at home, as it raises questions as to whether he himself was adhering to those Covid rules. Gosh, I do not miss those uh, video messages that we received from our great leaders, do you? Doing, oh. oh, goodness me, sitting behind their desk uh, at home. Although not in this case. Um, should we go to New York now and speak to GB News political editor Christopher Hope? Uh, Christopher, by the sounds of it, it's going to be a, a very busy day for the Prime Minister. He's got lots on his plate. Any update on whether he's going to have this meeting with Donald Trump? No. Well, hi, Emily. Hi, Tom from New York City. This uh, this uh, lunchtime for you. It's still an early in the morning here. No word yet. It's probably going to be a brush by which in the world of diplomacy means they kind of aren't meant to meet, then they come across each other in New York somehow. Um, <coughs> uh, a Bloomberg website is reporting it <coughs> from Trump's end. This meeting will happen. <coughs> no confirmation yet from the UK. We'll wait and see. And if that happens, it'll be quite a moment. It's difficult uh, diplomatically for that meeting, maybe for number 10, because Kamala Harris is in Washington, not here. He has never, she has never met with Sir Keir Starmer. So if he meets with Trump and not Harris ahead of the election in early November, that may look a bit difficult. So there's a trade-off to be made there. Of course, Zelensky and others may want Starmer to meet with Trump because Trump is, is an issue going forward. If he wins the election in early November, becomes the next president of the United States, there's a rumor and, and strong feeling, views that he may try and push Ukraine towards seeking a, um, a peace deal with Russia, which is not what Ukraine wants. So there's a trade-off between meeting with Trump, because it might help Zelensky, but also it may slightly embarrass uh, the Kamala Harris camp. As things stand, though, Emily and Tom, no word yet on that meeting. No, it's interesting, though, Chris. There's lots else going on today, including um, this investment lunch that you've been talking about. But I wanted to raise this issue with you. The Prime Minister today has tweeted this out on X. I wonder if you can get the picture up for us. He's boasting about new investment, he says. New. We have secured investment to create uh, one of the largest AI data centres in Europe, based in the northeast of England. It sounds amazing. Um, but, Chris, several people have pointed out that actually, if we can go to the next picture here, this was all announced by Northumberland County Council uh, three months ago, back in oh, over three months ago, sorry, back in April, under the last government. Is the government just re-announcing a deal that was already done by the previous administration? Yes, so Tom, well spotted. Uh, the answer from number 10 is yes and no, because this today is the first time that Blackstone, this big US company, has committed um, to this investment. Before that, it was hoped for, planned for. So this is the first time we're getting uh, ink, ink signed on the dotted line by Blackstone. And number 10 tell us that these kind of big deals do take time to come together. And they are, they are when they're this, they're of this scale, they have to work and talk to other partners like Northumberland Council ahead of time before it can be agreed. So what's happened is this has now formally been agreed by Blackstone, this big investment company, for the first time, and things take a while uh, to come to fruition. But that's right, so Keir Starmer is right now having a business breakfast with people like Macquarie, big investors. Um, as we do know from this conference speech we heard this week from the Prime Minister, he thinks that growth is of paramount importance and, it, and it's all about getting this economy growing. There's due to be a big investment summit, summit coming up uh, hosted by Rachel Reeves, uh, the Chancellor, and so that's the whole context of why they're doing these meetings. But aside from that, there's all sorts of diplomacy happening here, away from the Trump possible meeting. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the, the uh, European Union uh, president, uh, she met yesterday um, with Keir Starmer, and that's ahead of a meeting next week, which is really important. So while we're watching um, the, the, the four candidates for the Tory leadership uh, battle it out in, in, in their party conference, don't ignore Brussels, because right there, there could be some movement on whether we do a deal on under 30s from freedom of movement, which is something which the European Union is pressing for. 
away from that, in, in his speech tonight, we'll hear from uh, Keir Starmer. He'll be saying around 10.15 tonight, UK time, hopefully on GB News too, about he wants to get Britons out of Lebanon. And also they are concerned to push, try and help get a big package deal uh, agreed for Ukraine to take on Russia. But he flies back to London tomorrow with these concerns about freebies hanging over him and particularly the influence of Labour peer Lord Ali. Um, he's not backing down from that. He thinks you have to take freebies, going to football matches and the like, if you're going to meet people and do deals for the UK. But a question I asked him last night for GB News is why not give it all back? Why not give this, this stuff back to where it came from or to, or to, or to charities as a Labour MP has, has been doing herself? And here's what he had to say. A Labour MP for South Shields, Emma Lule Buck, gives her freebies to charity. He gives them away. Why won't you give things you've had for free back to charity or to, or from, to a good cause? Well, all that happened is I wanted somewhere safe and quiet for my son to do his GCSE preparation. I needed it to be secure because of the situation we were in. No exchange of money. There's nothing to give away. So Kistama there, so Kistama there not answering the question, would he give back the, the, the suit, the glasses, everything else to charity? Instead, he's doubling down. He sees a, a reason to take these freebies. They help him understand and, and, and almost woo investors uh, to this country. But I don't think the issue of Lord Ali has gone away anytime soon. I do wonder whether he'll continue to use the £18 million penthouse for various activities or whether he'll then decide that uh, better not anymore. Christopher Hope, thank you very much indeed. GB News political editor. Interesting that Blackstone story, that investment in that AI data centre. Well, at least the government can celebrate that it hasn't been dumped, that Blackstone <laughs> haven't dumped the idea, even if they didn't uh, kick it off. No, it's funny. The, 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 the use of the word from the council back in April was agreed. The use of the word from the Prime Minister was secured. Oh, yes. So, so OK, this agreed deal has now been secured. Um, OK, fine, good, but don't try and make it sound like an announcement. Well, it hasn't been dumped, and that is a good thing <laughs> for Britain. We need more AI data centres. We certainly do. You tell me yeah. we do. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Should we get some more reaction to all of the politics with political correspondent at The Spectator, James Hill? Uh, James, thank you very much indeed for coming on the show this afternoon. Um, this penthouse is causing quite the stir, isn't it, really? I mean, yesterday we had had £20,000 of accommodation. The use of this penthouse declared when well, we found it in the declaration of Keir Starmer's. Uh, today we find out that actually he's been using it for other reasons as well in, during COVID, for example, for his broadcasts to the nation. It's all rather odd, James. Yeah, well, I think it shows once more just um, how systemic the role was that Lord Ali has been playing for Labour over not just the past five years of Keir Starmer's leadership, but uh, a much longer period as well. Uh, obviously, there's the questions involving uh, the £18 million uh, flat, which was used for, I think, a seven-week period earlier this year. Of course, only half that period or so was the period in which GCSEs were being done. So questions of which, how, what was it kind of being used for? We understand that the flat was where Keir Starmer watched the exit poll come in on the morning of uh, the evening of July the 4th. Uh, and obviously, clearly, Lord Ali has had a very long term uh, relationship with Keir Starmer if he was using his flat during COVID to film these messages. So I think there's questions. All the newspapers today seem to lead on that. Uh, and it shows that for all the attempts to kind of move Labour off this story during the Labour conference speech, uh, for all the t talk of potentially of a, of a quiet reset, uh, now we're back to square one and facing more questions about the role that this multimillionaire played for the Labour leader. Yes, very curious. And a Particularly, uh, these stories do most damage when they're not a sort of one day done and gone mm. story, when they're a, a drip, drip, drip sort of story. We've seen this with, with scandals in the past, but when they run and run and the government isn't able to shut them down, they can be deeply politically da damaging. They certainly can. And I think that this Labour government has chosen not to have much in the way of a kind of uh, media briefing operation. Uh, they want to just say a news when they've got news. I think they want to take some of the sting out of the media cycle. But of course, in that absence, these stories then do continue to run and run. As you say, Tom, this is now, I think, about a, a sort of month old story. This story has been dominating since July and uh, late July. And I think that what it shows really is that Labour have not got a grip on it, not been able to put the questions to bed. And I think there's been an absence of anything 
something kind of in a positive narrative to try and take that place. So I think perhaps it's a sort of cautionary tale, as we're still in the first 100 days of this Labour government, that they might want to look at how they're operating things and responding to inquiries. I mean, and James, it's not just a concern that uh, Lord Wahid Ali is, is donating so much to Keir Starmer. It's also just the number of Labour politicians that he's donating to. He's extremely generous. He seems to be absolutely close buds with absolutely everyone in the Cabinet and also other Labour MPs. Siobhan Madonna, um, £1.2 million loan from Lord Ali to buy a house for her terminally ill sister. That, on the face of it, appears to be a, a kind thing to do. But the question is just... You know, why is this particular man uh, providing so much in the way of assistance to all of these senior Labour politicians? So I think if you look at Lord Wahid Ali's um, career, you know, he's always been an opponent of the left within the Labour Party. 40 years or so, he he talks fondly, if you speak to friends of his, about, uh, you know, sort of battling the, the left in, in the kind of... Uh, uh, faction as it was militant back then in the 1980s. Um, and so he's always someone who's been a moderate on the Labour wing. I think it's uh, two things. I think one of which is a genuine belief in Labour. Uh, Labour, of course, has done quite well with him, of course, and done a lot for him in terms of giving him that period back in 1998 when he was one of the first so-called uh, Tony's cronies to go to the Lords. The second thing is, I think, an attraction to the epicentre of power. This is someone who loves the fact that he's donated to eight members of the Cabinet, seven former Labour leadership contenders. Uh, and I think it shows really that he's someone who is not going to lack the controversies of the past um, deter him from investing in the party he's bankrolled for 25 years. He really believes, loves Labour uh, and clearly there are very few millionaires, given the way the economy's going, um, at the current time he's going to keep financing the party. Yeah, I suppose it does does make sense. If, if he's their only rich friend, then sort of they all have to um, but, lean yeah, upon him. I was sort of sponging off this one man. I can't I can't get over it. I can't understand it. I don't know why they're all accepting these, these lavish gifts, this ridiculous accommodation in Covent Garden. But, but then, James, there was the issue that he was given a pass to oh, Downing yes. Street, a, a, yeah. an, an incredibly exclusive pass. I think a lot of people think that, oh, he's, he's in the House of Lords, of course he can walk into Downing Street. I mean, that's, that's not how it works. Not even senior members of the Cabinet have that level of access. Yeah, and actually, if you talk to some parliamentarians, they're sort of a bit like, you know, MPs don't get that, as one MP said to me a bit sniffly. Uh, so I think that there is a sense about, uh, you know, this was definitely someone who was part of the team. And actually, you know, you talk to people who in Keir Starmer's number 10, they didn't think it was weird he was walking around because he was so used to them during the election. He was the person in charge of fundraising, calling up his wealthy contacts and friends, tapping high net worth individuals for the outreach. And he's obviously he played a role at this Labour conference, helping to coordinate donors for their £3,000 a day business day. So he's someone who was and remains a key part of the Starmer operation. I don't think they're going to drop him anytime soon. And the key thing, of course, is about, you know, how many other donors did get a pass to Downing Street? And obviously, they've Downing Street, under various different administrations, is always very cagey to say who has a pass and what. But certainly, just to be clear, it is very much not the norm for a Labour peer to have a number 10 pass uh, to Downing Street. Mm. No, I, I, I have to say that I spoke to, spoke to someone at the conference who attended the business day who was really rather underwhelmed by it. Very expensive tickets and all it was was a bunch of panel discussions, not the sort of access that uh, this particular businessman I spoke to was hoping for. So maybe Wahid Ali's been a bit distracted. Also, um, James, <laughs> uh, forgive me for putting you on the spot. Are you looking forward to Michael Gove being your editor at The Spectator? I'm sure he'll be a very successful editor. He, uh, of course, was a very successful journalist. And, um, yeah, I mean, The Spectator's had a wonderful 15 years with Fraser Nelson as editor. So uh, I'm excited to see what he does next as well. So uh, brave good new era at The Spectator. The only way is up. Thank you very much indeed. James Heal, political correspondent at The Spectator.